Okay, today we are in the Gospel of John. We are in chapter 17. And last time we finished the 16th chapter of John. And just, just to give a quick flyover review of the Gospel so far, we started way back, chapter 1, Jesus' existence and his work in eternity past. Then came up through chapter 12, explored his earthly life and his works, and uh, he, where he concluded his public ministry. And then the chapters up through chapter 16, where he had an intense private teaching sessions uh, with, with his closest disciples. And so that's where we left off last time. And today we get a glimpse into, guess what? Jesus' own prayer life. So we're talking about the Lord's Prayer today. So we're going to learn more about uh, both our prayer and his prayer. And as we explore chapter 17, we're going to see three distinct sections in the prayer. Uh, we'll cover one today and one probably, well, I won't, I won't predict how far we'll go. Sometimes I, I start digging and I find lots more than what I think I have time for. So, but it will, uh, the, the first, first section is he prays for the Father for himself and his Father to be glorified. And the next section, he prays specifically for his disciples. And then he extends that prayer to all believers in the future. So let's begin by reading from, and I'm, I'm reading from the New King James Version, John chapter 17, verse 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son might, may also glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I'm going to conclude at verse 5 there. And, you know, we know that Jesus prayed a lot, but we don't have many of those prayers recorded. This chapter actually contains the longest prayer recorded from Jesus in the scriptures. And, you know, prayer, sometimes people, oh, I don't know how to pray. Well, it's just simply talking with God. And to Jesus, being God the Son, uh, it was just as natural as breathing. Uh, and uh, talking is just as natural as you and I speaking to a loved one or friends as we, or, or acquaintances as we just met here. And so his prayers, though, um, are very different from what the disciples heard back from their religious leaders back then. Um, in, in fact, I, I, was, I looked back in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 8, during the beginning of his earthly ministry, and he was teaching about prayer. And he said, in contrast to what they were seeing out in their religious world, he said, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do. For they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. And later on, Luke records that the disciples had a longing. They saw Jesus' prayer in action, and, and they wanted to learn more. In chapter 11, verses 1 to 4, uh, it says, Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to, play, to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who's indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And you know, this last section I just read that Jesus said, here's your model prayer. It's been known, become known as the Lord's Prayer. And while there are some elements of this prayer, you'll see that Jesus does pray. There are certain ones that he doesn't pray. And so uh, let's look at what's in common, first of all. And you've, you've heard it sung here today as well. <laughs> so uh, the first thing is the prayer is directed to God the Father. There is another thing is that there's recognition for 
and concern for the holiness or the highness of the name of God. There's a, com there's a passion for the work of the kingdom of God in the prayer. There is concern for protection from evil, and there is a desire for the well-being of others. All of that are elements of the prayer that, um, that he taught them to pray and that he does pray himself in this chapter. But there are differences. For instance, since Jesus never sinned, he doesn't need to ask for forgiveness. You don't find Jesus asking Father for forgiveness. And also the prayer for, the, for this, uh, it verbalizes that God's name is honored and kept holy. And for Jesus, lifting up or glorifying Father God was an integral part of every part of his life and his entire life and mission here on earth. And you'll note that Jesus' prayer, uh, in this case, is not that of a, uh, an inferior or a servant to his master or to a superior. No, it's an exchange between two like-minded beings. So the passage in Luke 11 and Matthew 6, where he was teaching his disciples, I prefer to call the disciples' prayer. And this one in John 17, I call the real Lord's Prayer. But, you know, still as disciples, we can learn from, what, from the way that Jesus prayed. Uh, our first life, life lesson, just kind of throw this out here, just because someone labels a passage of Scripture with a certain term doesn't mean that it's accurate, okay? Just because a, someone labels a passage of Scripture with a certain term doesn't mean that it's accurate. So we're going to take a closer look as we do. Think about what we've heard over and over from Jesus in the last few chapters, that we can go to God and ask anything in Jesus' name that is the same way that Jesus would ask, and it will be done. Well, what better way to find out what to ask him and how to ask him than to listen to Jesus himself as he prays. So, uh, you know, what we find is real, honest prayer often reveals the hearts and the thoughts inside of a person. And there's no different here. John 17 allows us to see the nature and the heart of Jesus. In this prayer, Jesus teaches on, on so many things he's taught in the gospel. The glory, you know, uh, the lifting up of God. Uh, talks about being sent on missions and the value of believing. The state of the world. He talks about love. A lot of things. So I'm going to jump right in verse 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted his eyes up to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. Now, we might expect, you know, we know that the setting of this. This is between the time that his, uh, you know, one of his disciples went out to betray him and the time that he absolutely knows he's going to be killed, a torturous death. And so, you know, we, we might think it would be a gloomy prayer. It's like, oh, God, save me, help me know what to do, you know, give me strength. We don't see that here. It's different. It's not. Jesus just, he lifted his eyes up. I mean, if you're gloomy, you're like, Lord, help me with this thing. You know, that's not what he said. And, you know, so often we bow our heads, we close our eyes, but he was looking up in hope. And that's where Jesus was at. It's a prayer of faith and confidence that he prays. It's a victory despite facing a very real battle that was about to take place in the next few hours in his life. But you know, if you remember that last verse in the last chapter, Jesus declared that he had already overcome the world. And so, you know, I think not only his eyes, but his heart and mind and all were, were aimed towards heaven. He was, he was anticipating uh, wonderful things. He didn't make any mention of the problems that he had, that he was facing, didn't ask for directions. Oh, you know, God, how do I handle this? Um, you know, how do my disciples handle it? Any of those things. So I think it was that he already knew what he had to do. It was set in his heart and mind to do it. And, um, you know, he, he knew what it meant to me and to you today. He, he saw us long before this happened. And he said, these people need to be saved. These people need to be in right relationship with God. I want to live eternally with these people. And so he, he set his mind to do all of that way ahead of time. His heart and mind were focused on these high things, and he's, he pledged to completely fulfill God's mission for his life, no matter what the cost, no matter what the price that would cost him, so that our eternal life could be bought. And to me, it just blows me away that he, you know, he, he's so steadfast in this. And then he said, Father, the hour has come. And um, as tired as they were that night, I kind of think the disciples who heard this 
must have even, you know, at least for a few moments, sat up and take notice. Because many times in the last few years, you know, Jesus said, well, I can't do that. My hour has not yet come. Or, you know, those people tried to throw me off the cliff, but my hour had not yet come. They can't do anything. And he, many times he talked about his hour had not yet come. Now his hour had come. It was the hour for his glory. It's time now, and he knows it. Interestingly, he, he speaks about the hour. Now, do y'all know how long it was that he went through this next section? <laughs> through the trials, through the grief, through the torture, the betrayal that he'd gone through, getting ready to be arrested by guards, armed guards in the garden, uh, all of his friends fleeing, mock trials happening, whippings, beatings, crucifixion, painful death, slow death from, from suffocating at the same time as bleeding out. All that was taking place and he must not have realized that was gonna be more than an hour of pain, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did, of course he did. But he knew and was completely sure that what was coming from it was so much better than that. It would only seem like an hour. And, um, you know, he talked about in the last chapter about the, um, a woman having a baby. You know, there's, there's a lot of pain. And sometimes that's a lot more than an hour. Sometimes that's days of that happening for a, for a woman. But the joy is so much greater. And uh, I think that continues to carry on through his prayer here. Now, later on, uh, the Apostle Paul picks up on this. And he writes of the same assurance in Romans 8, 18. And he says in, in that verse, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So we see Jesus prays at this point for his own glory, asking Father God, to, saying, Glorify your Son. Well, that's a little selfish, isn't it? Everybody's, what? What? <laughs> Jesus selfish? No, actually, it's not a selfish prayer because he immediately reflects back on the reason. What's the reason to glorify your son? Because that glory will be directed back to God the Father. As he continues, that your son may also, your son also may glorify you. Here he's praying basically for a successful mission. Father, I want a successful mission. I want this to, to be so that you receive the glory that you give to me. His prayer for himself was for the glory of the Father. The Son can only glorify the Father if the Father first answers the prayer and glorifies the Son. Okay? <laughs> so get a picture of this. It would not bring glory to the Father if Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was not acceptable or things didn't work out like they were supposed to. If the Son is not restored to his rightful place in the presence of the Father, that would mean the mission had failed. And so... Success and glory to the Son reflected back to the Father is exactly the way it needed to happen. And he's just confirming that with the Father. Jesus gave the basis also for this prayer. And I'll, let me back up and say that again. Jesus gave the basis for this prayer as he petitions the Father to glorify the Son. And I'll talk about that basis and, and why, what that, why that's important for us in a moment. But he says, first of all, the hour has come. He says, number two, because the, the Father will be glorified. Number three, because Jesus had already been given authority to grant eternal life. Number four, because Jesus is the only way that people could get eternal life. And number five, because it finishes the work that the Father sent the Son to perform. So he is repeating back to God, hey, these are, this is why I'm asking, I want you to glorify the Son so you can be glorified. All of these things, these reasons. And, you know, I thought, why is he repeating all this stuff back to God? I mean, God knows that. He knows it. And it's for us. This was written for us. It gives us a guideline as we pray and prepare to pray for our heavenly, I mean, to our Heavenly Father. Did you know there's times that before you go in, into prayer, you should prepare, maybe even study for what you're going to be praying for? I, I think we do. <laughs> you may not have thought about it before, but you know, if, if God the Son made up a list of reasons, of things that he was asking, why he was asking God the Father for things, shouldn't we also give attention to the same request when we go before the throne of God and ask him things? So our, our life lesson for us to pull out of this is praying in the name of Jesus requires us to study to find out the basis for our request. Praying in the name of Jesus requires us to study 
to find the basis for our requests. You know, no wonder Jesus uh, told us, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do. They just saying something, they heard somebody else say. Why? Because it sounded good. And they said they were praying. So yeah, I'll, I'll just repeat word. That must be praying, right? <laughs> you know, it's not a mindless adventure, it's not a mindless ritual that we're doing. Um, or it's not a shopping list. You know, others are, <laughs> I remember a few years ago, there was a song, you know, here, here's my shopping list, God. You know, I want a, a new car. You know, house at the beach with a pool by the side. And then, you know, <laughs> just gave the whole list off. You know, my never-ending shopping list. It was her prayer. But no, it's, it's a conversation. Who's that a conversation with? Well, it's obviously it's an all-powerful God. And it's also a loving, intelligent, logical, generous, and righteous father. Okay? Sometimes we just... I'm not saying every time when you go to pray that you have to study a whole lot at that moment. We study through our whole lives as we study the scriptures. Sometimes we just pour our hearts out to them. You don't have to study for that. Man, God, I feel so bad. I'm, you know, I'm in this mess, just like you would to a friend. But you know, other times when you make requests for them, I kind of picture sometimes, I think about God saying, why? Yeah, and that goes through my mind. As I'm, as I'm praying, why should God grant this request for me? And Jesus' prayer here is a great example. As we study God's word, he's made a lot of promises to us. And, you know, some of these promises are unconditional. This will always be. And some are conditional. Okay, so if he has a conditional promise, and I'm asking for a fulfillment of that conditional promise, and I haven't done that condition, I don't have any right to go to God and ask him to do this for me. Now, I might do it anyway. <laughs> he might be merciful and gracious and answer anyway. But, you know, I, I, the Bible tells us, Jesus says, ask anything in my name, in my nature. So let's, you know, if you do it the way God uh, told us through Jesus, you know, that's, that gives a basis for your request. Um, if you pray something that's not lifting up the Lord, guess what? We know it can be ruled out as a prayer in the nature, in the name of Jesus, okay? If it's not, if we know it's not God's will, I mean, don't even ask, <laughs> you know? If you, if you do know that it aligns with God's will, that it will bring him glory, that maybe it's a conditional promise and that's been satisfied, don't hesitate to ask. You know, one thing that, that's always in line, if you have friends, loved ones that need to come to Jesus, that's always in line to ask, okay? That's always in God's will for someone to come to Jesus. Now, and there's a lot of other things in our lives that, that are always in line to ask. But, you know, I, I do want to mention here that God does know a lot more than we do. He has much better plans for you and for me than we can imagine, and so if your request does seem to fit the nature of Jesus, don't hesitate. But, you know, his answer may not be what you're expecting it to be. And at that point, instead of being sad like we tend to want to do, we should rejoice because we know that God is planning something better than what we had figured out ourselves. So uh, is it easy? No, not all the time. <laughs> but... You know, it's, it's exciting to look forward to discovering what God's plans are when it's not what we're expecting. So I'm going to go back and continue in today's text. I'm going to go back to verse 1 so we keep it all flowing. Verse 1 and 2. So Jesus spoke these words, lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may also glorify you. And as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Now, once again... Jesus here is making a clear claim to his deity. We've seen him, uh, I'd say every chapter and almost every teaching where Jesus makes a claim to deity, either directly or indirectly, but he does make that claim. Nobody made up that Jesus said he is God. Jesus did say he was God. He claims to have the authority to determine the eternal destination of everybody. Okay, that is only something <laughs> that is the power of God to be able to do. And if he had not been around for the last few years in this case, and demonstrating the power of God through his life and teaching these things, um, they could have just written him off as a crazy person. I mean, honestly, if you walk out here today and one of these guys says, hey, I can give you eternal life, 
Really? You know, who are you believing on? Oh, I'm, I'm God. Okay, tell me more, you know, and they haven't done, they haven't done what Jesus has done. Uh, you know, they're a little on the nuts side, okay? But let, let's extend that even further, though. Some people say Jesus was a good man. He wasn't God, but he was a good man, or he was a great prophet. And then they deny that he was actually God. Well, you can't do that. Someone that claims to be God had better either be God himself or else he's the worst kind of sinner possible. Okay, it just doesn't work both ways. So we can only conclude that Jesus is legitimately making this claim and it gives us, um, it gives some inspiration, I think, and, and some hope that we can go out and we can evangelize and we can reach out to other people and let them know the good news because Jesus has this authority over everyone. Now, back in his day, the, the Jewish people, you know, felt that with, they didn't know the scriptures as well as they should have. They felt that only the Jewish people could be saved, could, could have salvation in God. They kind of missed a whole bunch of scriptures by, by thinking that way, but that's what they thought. But you know, now we don't have to qualify somebody to see if they're eligible to hear the good news about Jesus. Okay, or were you born in the right family? Uh, check. You have enough money? Uh, check. You happen to live in the right place on the planet? Check. You know, have you been taught to live by these words, the, the scriptures, and are you following those? Check. No, you don't have to do any of that with somebody. Even those who are currently rejecting Jesus and God and are ignorant of him, whether they admit it or not, they're still subject to the authority of Jesus. So I think that's pretty neat because those who, know, who now believe it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to, to me that someone would not choose to have eternal life in Jesus Christ. You know, it's kind of like, would you prefer a juicy hamburger or a nasty hamburger? Take your pick. Oh, well, give me the nasty one. You know, no, you're not going to do that. But in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verses 14 and 16, it tells us, But in fact, their minds were hardened, for they had lost the ability to understand. For until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is un removed only in Christ. But whenever a person turns in repentance and faith to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Okay, I think that's a, that's a key to why some people are not understanding. We need to be praying. We pray in faith for God to lift the veil that's covering the understanding of unbelievers, to open their spiritual eyes, so to speak, so that they can repent and believe in Jesus. Then they can see him and they can accept him. So our life lesson is we must pray that God opens the spiritual eyes of unbelievers so they may see the truth of Jesus. We must pray that God opens the spiritual eyes of unbelievers so that they may see the truth of Jesus. And the scriptures in Philippians 2, 9 to 11 also give us a clear picture of Jesus' authority that was given to him and why we should be sharing it with people that do not yet believe. You know, someone says, I don't believe the Bible. That's the best person to share the Bible with. <laughs> you know, who else would you want to share it with? Those that already believe, already believe. But it says, therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, sometimes you hear people say, um, oh, all paths lead to God. I think everything will lead, eventually lead to God. And, you know, by this verse, it is true. Everybody one day will eventually meet Jesus. Okay, but if the first time you confess that Jesus is Lord, it was when you bow at the judgment seat and you have no choice but to confess that he is the ruler, that he has the authority, and you've rejected him all the way up until that day, uh, he is going to allow you to receive the condemnation that you've chosen. You know, he's gonna, the judgment will have to be, you chose. You know, now you recognize I'm here. You chose to reject what I've offered you, and you forfeit eternal life with him. The, the Bible says in John 3, 18, it says, he who believes in him, Jesus, is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
You know what I mean? And we know Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. If he hadn't come, we wouldn't be saved. There's no way we could be saved. So in our text, <clears throat> back to John 17, verse 2 says that the Son gives eternal life to as many as the Father has given him. Jesus understood that he is the one and the only one who grants eternal life to those that are given to him by the Father. Sort of think about that. Those given to him by the Father. You know, so many times we're thankful that we realize that eternal life is a gift that God gives us, that Jesus gives us. It's God's gift to us. Did you know that you, if you receive him, you are a gift to Jesus from God the Father? It's a two-way street. It's a relationship we have. You know, I hadn't really considered before that I'm a gift, but I'm one of God's gifts to Jesus. Ah, oh, man. He's got a pretty bad gift here, but you know, it's, I'm a gift that he died for so that we could spend eternity together. And you know, that's pretty awesome. I can't, I can't beat myself up too much when I, when I think about that, you know? Um, but you know, we, we also see here in, the, in these verses that Jesus is, is praying that uh, we, we can start to, even if dimly, understand some of the differences of the work of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as it applies to our salvation. You know, each member of the Trinity has specific activity. And Jesus indicates that the Father gifts people, gifts some people to the Son. And then what the Son does, the Son gives them eternal life through his work on the cross. Now, those are just two little tidbits there. If I go much further beyond that, you'll realize how really dim my mind is. And I'm, not, I'm sure not everybody can fully claim, okay, this is what the Father always does, the Son always does this, the Holy Spirit in, in, in knowing everything because we don't know all of that. But you know, I, I think it's pretty incredible that for us to remember that uh, and take from this that Christ has the power to give eternal life, God-filled, incredible life, forever that doesn't end. It's the life God had meant for us to have in the garden, but we reject it. And he chooses to give it to who? To those who trust him. And he says in verse three, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So you've got to understand that Jesus, the son of God and the one praying, and God the Father, the one being prayed to, fully understand what eternal life is. That's something else in this prayer. Jesus understands the end from the beginning, all of that. He, they've always existed from eternity past. They will always exist into eternity future. You know, it's not a, they don't just have a theological or theoretical or even a scientific hypothesis. You know, if I, if I do this or mix these ingredients, I'll live forever. No, that's not at all. That's not a scientific thing. Sometimes people put trust in science, which is actually not a, an authority, science is discovering what God's put out there for us. And so, um, but it's not, a, it's not a theoretical thing or a scientific experiment. Eternal life is what both God the Father and Jesus the Son constantly have experienced forever up till this point, and they found it to be the ultimate gift that they can give to somebody that they love and desire to have a relationship with. Okay, you know, even in this world, we know it's a blessing you know, you probably know, have certain people that you, you've been around. Maybe you get to hang out with them a lot, maybe not so much. But people that are a blessing and an inspiration just to hang out with, just to be around them. It's like, oh, it's so nice to be with these people. And, but, you know, how much more is the case when we get to know God? Okay? Life is the active involvement of uh, being with your environment, of you know, a breathing soul has with the environment around him. And, and death is when that involvement stops, okay? whether it's physical or personal. So eternal life means that we are alive in an active part of God's environment, which is forever. If God's personal presence is not a prevailing life force within us, um, then can we have that eternal life? It, it seems from these verses that we can't. We, we have... We have to be in God. We have to be with God to have that eternal life. And living a life that's condemned uh, and staying in a condemned state, not believing, um, is a, it's oblivious to God, really. And remember, knowing God is not just knowing something about God. I feel bad. Sometimes there's people that say, oh, I've read the Bible. Some people have even memorized parts of the Bible. They don't know God. It doesn't help 
<laughs> you know? Um, I mean, my wife is wonderful, but somebody could read about her, but if they don't know her, they're not gonna know how wonderful she is. You know, people, um, anyway, uh, people that know better than I do um, and have read this, this passage in the original Greek languages, they, they look at that word know, where it says that Jesus said that they may know you, and uh, they say it's an ongoing, growing experience, an active, living, uh, growing relationship. And so we learn from this that Jesus is saying eternal life is a constantly growing relationship with God the Father and his Son, Jesus, and that we're always discovering more and more about our Creator. So the life lesson for us to take away is the life of a follower of Jesus is not stale and boring, but it's constantly fresh and growing. The life of a follower of Jesus is not stale and boring, but it's constantly fresh and growing. So, uh, something else. As we continue through this prayer, we realize that it doesn't hurt to remind God of what he's told you in the past and what you've done in obedience to him. You're not bragging, you're just putting it out there. And we see Jesus do that in verse four. He says, I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Pretty straightforward. Jesus didn't wait until his final mission work on the cross was accomplished before he said, I'll glorify the Father. Uh, I had a friend that was a race car driver one time, uh, a few years back, was still a friend, but he, he was driving race cars and um, he, he thought he was a Christian and he thought, you know, when I win, when I win the big race, then I can get up and I can give God the glory and I can brag on God and what he's done. And he said, uh, well, one year, I believe it was one year to the day at the spot that um, Dale Earnhardt died, he crashed into the wall, put him in the hospital, almost killed him. And he, he got to thinking, and as he's reading scriptures, he realized he needed to give God glory now and not wait until the end of something. And um, that man, is he, he's reached so many people since then. And he be just from his position as a, as a race car driver, he was able to go into schools and to teach and to, to talk with people. And there would always be questions. And the things he'd talk about, he didn't talk about God and Jesus and religion and the public schools he went into in his speech, but he would always leave things in there where they would want to ask him questions. And the answers to those questions was Jesus. <laughs> so it was a great opportunity he had. Well, we see Jesus here didn't wait to glorify God until he died on the cross. His entire life was in obedience to God. He glorified him even before he was born. Just him being willing to go and, and obey caused the angels in heaven to rejoice and to announce this baby's gonna be born and it's gonna be God and you know all the thing, other things that came in. And we have records of his dedication as, as a child and in the temple of God and how he was teaching the teachers and, and how they were learning about God. And you know he, Jesus was bringing him glory there and before his ministry started, he continued to glorify his father through obedience and through the work as he went into his ministry in his earthly years. Every sermon he preached, every blind eye that he opened, you know, every body that he healed, each sick person, every bit of instruction and training and teaching that he gave, every confrontation with each of the religious leaders that were corrupt, every question he answered, every loving touch, every look, they all glorified God the Father. Wow, we, we should, <laughs> what an example for us. But all of it was a direct obedience to God. That's what God had sent, God the Father had sent to him. So our life lesson is that our obedience to the will of the Father brings him glory. Our obedience to the will of the Father brings him glory. You know, Jesus then said, I have finished the work. Does that seem a little odd to you? This is the night before or during the night when he was going to be crucified later on. He was still alive. But, you know, we know the work of Jesus wasn't finished the work on the cross, that final sacrifice for sin wasn't made. And then the proof of, of his power, the resurrection hadn't happened yet. So what's I have finished the work about? Give you something to think about. See, these are the kind of weird things I think about when I'm reading through these things. 
Well, you know, I believe Jesus was speaking of all the work, first of all, all the work up till that point, work that him showing God to mankind. Uh, we mentioned back, um, well, we mentioned he finished his public teaching. He continued with the disciples and their private teaching. That's enough to satisfy me that he had finished these things. But then he showed, he had been showing God's power through his teaching, through his actions, through his miracles over the many years. But in another way, Jesus had assurance for the future. He knew, he had the confidence, he knew what was supposed to happen. He had the assurance that before that day was done, that was all gonna be taken care of as well. And he wanted the Father to receive all the glory. And it was coming up in this very public display of the sacrifice that was gonna happen. Now, um, you may also wanna, theologically, if you're a theologian, you may wanna look and say, well, technically, Revelation 13, 8 says that Jesus is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. So yeah, back then it was done. But you know, it's a greater sense that uh, I think that the work was already finished because it was completed in the heart and the mind and the will of Jesus Christ. From when creation began, they laid the plans. Hey, here's mankind. Oh, they're going to fall. How are we going to rescue them? Okay, Father, God, I'll do it. I think at that point in time, it was all done. It was a done deal in his, in his heart. And now it just had to be walked through. You ever do that? You make plans and all you had to do was just finish walking through them. Um, as it applies to us, there's that sense that the transformation that God has done in our heart and life has been completed before the fact. You know, at this point, it just has to be walked through. We just have to continue on, carry through. And there's a recognition that Jesus completed his task brought glory to God the Father in the process, and it will bring glory to God as we complete the task that he gives us. Another life lesson. Continuing in faith to the end will bring glory to God. Continuing in faith to the end will bring glory to God. Now, we, we talk a lot about a relationship with God, even though the, the term, you know, some people pick on Christians that are reading the scriptures because we know that he talks about, it talks about a relationship with God. But we talk about that, the word rela personal relationship with Jesus Christ is not in the Bible, but it's all through the Bible <laughs> at the same time. And that's what he wants from us. And, you know, I, I kind of thought through, well, maybe is that a partnership? Is that an alliance? Or is that a teamwork that we're doing? And, you know, really those things don't recognize the the greatness of God or the personal aspect of what brings us together with God. And so as Jesus continues prayer, he, he isn't, he's not on a, on a team with God and then he's going to break out and he's going to start his own team. Okay. Or, or he's not in a partnership or an alliance. And then later on, you know, we're going to start our own alliance and we're going to have all these alliances and you know, all these little things going on. And, um, you know, it kind of sounds like a crazy idea, but you know, there are some, <laughs> There's one large hold I'm thinking in particular that teaches that such a thing will happen and that you need a lot of wives so that you can populate your own world and that you'd be God of your own planet at that point in eternity. And Jesus here in his relationship with God is not saying that. He's, the prayer isn't glorify me so I can shine in my own world now. We see in verse five, Jesus says, and now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. He was asking the Father to glorify him with that same glory he had, that his Father has, not a new custom-made glory of his own that he has with the Father. He came, he communicated God to mankind. He was returning to the Father. Jesus' prayer was in no way a declaration of independence from the Father, but of utter and complete dependence on God and unity with him. Now, many men want to draw attention to themselves, uh, you know, crying out, glorify me uh, in different ways, maybe not using those words, but sometimes they even uh, pray. And as you listen to them, you're wondering, uh, are they praying to God for God's glory? Or are they praying for their own glory? You know, God, give me this or, so I can do this and so I can do that. Um, no, that's, that's completely different from the way Jesus is setting our example here. Uh, glorify me together with yourself is what he says. That's the difference between dependence on God and independence or separation from God. I don't want to be separated from God. Okay, That's not a good place to be. Jesus declared his full dependence on God. He was specific. He talked about the glory he had with his father before the world existed. 
Uh, he's fully aware of that eternity past and the nature of that, and he understood, uh, you know, he, he knew there was a time to share the past, and he knew that time would come together again in the future. And that once again, you know, we're just a couple of verses away from another time he, he declared himself to be God, but he's saying it again, uh, Yahweh, uh, I mean, he, he couldn't truthfully or, or sanely pray such a prayer unless he was Yahweh, unless he was God himself. Isaiah 42, 8, God declares, I am Yahweh, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. There's other places where Yahweh proclaims that he does not share his glory with anybody else. So if the Father and God, God the Father and God the Son, share their glory, guess what? They're both Yahweh. They are both God. No question. And here Jesus had one main petition, that the Father would receive him back to the glory that he had relinquished in, to, in order to become able to come and do his earthly mission. So this petition, he basically wants to come back. He wants to come back and be reunited. And uh, again, displays his uh, pre-existence with God and his equality with the Father. The Gospel of John emphasizes this glory all throughout its pages. John was careful to record this in many of its pages. This life was, uh, the life of Jesus was a presentation of God's glory. The disciples beheld his glory, the scripture says. And in the first teaching of this book, the very first words, in the beginning was the word, that was logos in Greek, or the English, the word means divine expression or communication. And Jesus fulfilled that beautifully. He expressed, he communicated God to the people that were there. The, the miracles displayed the, the, his glory. Um, the, the teaching displayed the wisdom of God that only, only God could have. He never ever sought uh, any other glory for himself other than the glory of God the Father. Faith and belief in the words of Jesus are rewarded by seeing the works of the, by seeing the glory of God. Mary found out, you know, Jesus told Mary, you know, if you just believe, you'll see the glory of God. Well, you know, she declared, I believe, but then she found out more. There's more to belief than what she thought. And Lazarus was raised from the dead. Um, Jesus spoke many times of his coming crucifixion would be a coming glorification. That would be lifting him up, not only physically, but also spiritually and in the eyes of people. And they didn't quite understand how that worked, but they will in a few days in, in this uh, passage we have. So as we conclude the initial Wrap up this initial portion of Jesus' prayer. There's no doubt as to what the basis for our prayer should be. Our prayer in Jesus' name should always focus on giving God the glory. And there's a lot of little nuances there. Do our all, do, but we can ask ourselves from this, do our prayers always seek to give God the glory? Or are they just simply maybe a self-righteous, um, uh, self-satisfying way to bring glory to ourselves when we pray? If we come to the sad conclusion that they're selfish, there's only one thing we can do. That's change, okay? And, and I, sometimes I catch myself, I start praying, it's like, oh, hold it, hold it, hold it. That's not a good way to pray. God, erase that, let's start over, <laughs> you know? And there's lots of tips in, in the scriptures we read here about how to do that. And I encourage you to go back and listen again, take some notes if you want to. And in the first few G verses here in this chapter, Jesus gave us a lot of things that could help us refocus our prayer life on the things that really matter and truly pray to the Father in the name of Jesus and in the nature of Jesus. So I hope you've learned something today. Brothers and sisters, I uh, love for you to continue to experience, experience the joy of fully trusting in Jesus uh, and ask for his peace to flow through you each day. Hope your lives are filled with his glory as uh, you fulfill everything God has called you to do and, want, and has for you in your life. Thank you for coming today and God bless you.